This audiobook contains scenes, language, and subject matters unsuitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Chapter 8 360 Years After the Incident In the dim light of the suite, I sat before the wall screen. Six new results were displayed, six new potentials. Number four, I instructed Casey, my voice dry and hoarse from a day of heavy drinking. The screen zoomed in on the fourth face, her head slowly rotating. She would be another blonde, but that was to be expected. Dark hair was rare in every village now. When the priorities handpicked their volunteers, they had clear physical preferences. The ripple from those decisions now spread. Another noticeable physical attribute was exclusive to the women, something I had noticed with Elena Seven. Both features were now impossible to alter, but they were minor concerns. Her face was all that mattered. If worst came to worst, there was always the option of hair dye. The other physical attribute... Well, I just have to live with that. I lifted the veil and paused a moment before saying, lie with me. As we lay next to each other in the tent, face to face, I remained silent for several minutes. She was patient, neither moving nor saying a word during that time. Elena 19 was a success, exceeding both Elena 17 and Elena 18 by almost 10%. Lost in thought, I spoke aloud, my voice almost a whisper. Memories. Do you think they're passed down? Elena 19 looked back at me, puzzled. I am Elena. No understand. I looked at her, pausing in contemplation. Do you remember deep down, the day we first met? I am Alina meet High Crowda today, she replied, wondering if this was a test. What color was your dress? Tell me. She hesitated, unsure of what I expected from her. I ran my finger down the curve of her nose. This bump shouldn't be here, I observed. We need to try again. With each step, the crunch of leaves beneath my boots became a rhythmic beat. Casey was no longer needed when I returned to the cradle. I remembered the route. It's strange how some memories embed themselves in the mind, while others remain stubbornly elusive. Perhaps it's the power of repetition. Every time I wake from stasis, I forget so much and have to be reminded by my logs. But the one thing that I and all my past selves share is this walk. How many times had I, or we, made this journey? I couldn't say. The fact that I had just reviewed Elena 49 suggests it couldn't be fewer than 200 times. Checking my wrist comm, I saw I still had a full two hours. Why rush? I could relax by the lake I was passing. My evening in the cradle would be no different than any other. Some drinks in the bar, a little piano, followed by whatever meal I'd request the bots to prepare. I was in the mood for steak that night. I heard a splash of water and slowed my pace. The splashes were punctuated by playful laughter. Pushing aside some low-hanging branches, I caught a glimpse of the lake, shimmering under the last traces of daylight. Four young women were bathing and swimming, which seemed an odd choice at this hour. None of them resembled Elena, but each held unique beauty. For a long moment, I stood there, captivated by their tall, perfect figures. All I had to do was reveal myself and give the order. None would run or flee. But as one of the women turned and almost spotted me, I retreated into the shadow of the branches and waited for the moment to pass. As I lingered, I could both see and hear Bobby Boy with his devilish grin. Heaven on new earth. Enjoy every second. I looked directly into the camera lens. The next Amelina will be the 50th, I continued. 50 is already too many. She won't be perfect, but none of them ever will be. If she feels something for you, fine, let it develop. If not, you need to walk away. 
I ran my fingers through my hair, praying I was getting through. I know it may seem tempting, doing whatever you want, but you can't let those thoughts consume you. Not now, not ever. The last thing she ever would have wanted is for us to turn into them. When you remember her, remember that. After I finished the recording, I called out to Casey on the intercom. Make sure I watch this as soon as I wake. You got that? As, as you, you wish, wish, sir. I finished what was left of my whiskey and set down the glass. The suite fell silent. Every time I woke from stasis, I'd forget. Especially the events that didn't repeat themselves. Unless I reminded myself, I wouldn't remember something that only happened once, or twice. I understood that now. The bathroom door slid open. I slowly turned my head as the light from within spread over me. The two young women from the lake emerged. It would just be a dream. A former world, another life. In a poorly lit hallway, muffled music vibrated through the graffiti-tagged walls. It was the kind of music that grated on my nerves. Real music peaked in the 20th century, I thought. Everything since then has been a hollow repetition, with slight variations to sell to the ever-merging single demographic. A sultry voice, belonging to a woman I couldn't quite see, beckoned from a shadowy corner. Make your dreams come true, baby. I glimpsed her pale skin and popping veins, another taser junkie. I tightened my coat around me and adjusted my face mask. Every face I passed in the rundown residential block was a potential threat, both socially and physically. Just one picture could cause months of nuisance, plastered all over the net and socials. Some expensive PR would rectify the problem, but it would still draw unwanted attention. Attention my father had made clear we needed to avoid at least until everything was in the green. I pushed open the door I sought, unlocked and slightly ajar as I was promised, and stepped into the dimly lit apartment. It had been abandoned for some time. Remnants of squatters or junkies could be glimpsed. I heard steady tapping from one of the quiet rooms and made my way there. The tapping was from the window, heavy rain. The glass must have been coated at some point as it didn't seem as eroded as I expected it to be. I was about to check my wrist comm to confirm my location when a loud moan from the apartment next door interrupted me. The person, whether man or woman, was clearly getting their money's worth. Did you know that when nearing extinction, Mother Nature will push a species to reproduce? I turned and saw her outline. One last, desperate grasp. She sat in the corner pressing a pellet into her wrist from the shadows. I waited as she enjoyed the taser. She was in her forties and from her chic dress clearly one of the more comfortable corpo types. The small case she stored her taser made that clear. Mother Nature's warning sign, she mused. But you know all about warning signs, don't you, Sebastian? I pulled down my face mask. You know who I am? Constance smirked. Only son of the seventh richest man on the planet? Yes, I'm well aware who you are. As she came into view, I saw that she hid her addiction well. She was pale, but had a good makeup job. Is a place like this really necessary? Real discretion exists in two places, high at the top and low at the bottom. Watching her prep another hit of taser, I asked the obvious. Is this why they took you off the program? She laughed, a bitter note in her voice. I wasn't taken off, I left. Volunteered, if you will. I paused, uncomfortable. She knew. How many others? More than you think, she answered, but fewer than would be of any concern. No one's gone public? It wouldn't make any difference. Going public now would only hasten the collapse. She prepped another pellet. People like your father have nothing to worry about, of course. The retirement homes are almost ready, from what I hear. But up there, that's where the real fun begins. All their lucky Adams and their less fortunate Eves. Her blasé attitude made my blood boil. I'm curious. She leaned forward. You disapprove, but you're still going. You could take the sanctuaries, maybe even live to fifty, but you're going. I have my reasons, I answered, keeping my cards close. 
Constance's eyes twinkled with mischief. There's only one reason and that's a someone. Someone you couldn't get into Antarctica but can get up there. Can't be a man, all those seats are taken. Which means it must be a girl. I stepped forward, trying to keep a stern front. What do you get out of this? She leaned back with another smile. No harm in making the last two steady decades more comfortable. And what can you offer to earn that comfort? She took some more taser, deliberately making me wait, enjoying the release of the drug and her brief control over me. I can have you wake from stasis early, she finally revealed. A day, a week, a month, whatever you want. What good will that do? She looked at me, amused. For someone as highly educated as you, you surprise me, Sebastian Wilder. She leaned slightly forward. Volunteers aren't wiped until the final activation. With the systems on standby, we can give you the means to override the presets. I stopped. I can cancel the fresh starts. You can do whatever you want. Wipe the priorities and restore the volunteers. Wipe the volunteers and remove the priorities entirely. She smiled, darkly. One man with two hundred women, slaves to his every word. A new god on a new earth. That's not what I want, I said firmly. I know, she looked at me, almost with a hint of pity. You just want one special girl to remember you. She sighed and slowly rose, packing away her small VIP taser kit. You're a romantic. A fatal flaw or a divine blessing. Hard to tell these days. She approached the open door and stopped, her sharp silhouette casting a shadow. Transfer the funds and your sleeping beauty will not forget her prince. I guarantee it. But I'd hurry. She looked at the window as the rain intensified, her voice tinged with acceptance and defeat. Last flights to the new world will be leaving soon. I awoke to a pounding heart and icy sweat. I thought I could still hear the tapping rain, but it faded quickly. As the curtains drew back, the artificial sunlight from the screens, which flawlessly mimicked windows, spread over the large bed. I slowly sat up, the strange dream of some drug addict corpo woman fading. I turned my head and noticed the large pillows beside me on the bed. Both were pristine and untouched. I then remembered the previous night. Where did they go? Where did who go, sir? Casey responded from the intercom. I hesitated with guilt. The women, the ones I brought in last night. You were the sole occupant within the cradle last night, Casey stated. I looked around the room. There was no sign of them. Was that also part of the dream? Is everything all right, sir? Casey asked with her default pre-programmed concern. Yes, I gathered myself. I'm fine. It was just a dream. My subconscious was warning me alerting me to the temptations. Temptations I had managed to resist for so long. I didn't bring back those three women. I probably never even saw them washing their clothes by the stream. Will you be reviewing the Amelina this morning or this afternoon? Casey inquired. Afternoon, I answered, slowly climbing out of the bed. After a cold shower and a hot coffee, I slipped on my wrist comm and ventured back to the village. Elena, 63, awaited. Chapter 9. 1,280 Years After the Incident My waking days between stasis cycles blurred. Each time I entered the tent and lifted their veil, I immediately noticed the relevant minor flaw that needed to be rectified or the subtle improvement that could be made. In a strange way, it was like shaping a mold of clay. I was an artist, sculpting a perfect work of art over the span of hundreds of years and many generations. I would hear their familiar yet slightly varying voices repeat the same three words on each visit. I am Alina. I am Alina. I am Alina. All of them could now engage in basic conversation, and while they were never allowed to fully flourish, their general intelligence also increased with each new generation. However, for the longest time, they all hovered in the 80% range. My work of art was stagnating. Casey explained that as the rest of the island's population changed, more options would become available, more physical characteristics. In a village to the south, one male had developed dark hair. I tried to isolate and encourage this genetic trait, 
comparing the boy and his descendants with others who bore darker hair shades. I came close to achieving Raven Black and tried to incorporate this trait with the next Amelina, hoping I could eventually have an Amelina with natural black hair. The experiment was a failure, and the Amelina's facial match dropped to under 50%. I was furious with myself for taking such a careless gamble, and feared that I had caused irreversible damage. Fortunately, after only four subsequent generations, I managed to return her face to the 80% range. When I eventually crossed the 90% milestone, I thought it would be cause for celebration. However, as I looked upon Elena 113, I remained silent. Have I done something wrong? She asked when she saw me making a note on the peculiar device on my wrist. No, I responded. You haven't done anything wrong. Her freckles and blemishes, though rectifiable with masking creams, were simply too prominent. Elena had perfect porcelain skin. I returned the veil to her face and would try again. My recordings for my next amnesia-stricken self were short and brief, as little needed to be added to the basic essentials already available from earlier entries. But as time went on, suggestions and changes were made. The more interaction she has with others, the better her social skills. The more you hear her speak freely, the more you will remember. You have to give her more freedom. The veil was phased out, and while the Amelinas were still protected, they were no longer confined to their white tent. As more time passed, as promised, newly awakened memories were shared through the new log entries. These memories would provide valuable encouragement and motivation, dispelling or distracting my next self from any doubts regarding the ethical nature of what I was doing. The butterfly tattoo on the back of her shoulder, she got that a month after we met. She chose it because of us. She said her life was so painful before we met, but we had changed her, transformed her. We made her feel as light as a butterfly. We took her to places she had never been. Paris, Rome, New York. Those were big cities in the old world. The parties, the dances, the dinners, the art galleries. The way we made love on those white sheets. I remember... <laughs> blue. Blue was our favorite color. That's why she chose blue for the butterfly. I remember now. Were these memories, which seemed to bring tears of joy to my previous selves, even true? Or were they just to spur the next awakened me to continue? Some of the memories were able to elicit strong reactions, such as the origin of the butterfly tattoo, implying that they were true. Others, however, remained elusive. Could I have been deceiving myself? Or was my occasional inability to recall memories that my predecessor had just another side effect of my exploitation of stasis. Stasis, ready. I could never really know. Chapter 10. 5,200 years after the incident. I watched her walking alone through the surf this morning. She didn't know I was watching. She did a twirl just like she used to when we danced. I've never seen an Amelina so happy. She didn't know it at the time, but a 93% match was growing inside her. That twirl she did, was it her doing or someone else's? Someone both new and from the past, shining through her. I was greeted with some good news and two pieces of bad news. The first piece of bad news. The cradle's power core had been depleted. The good news. The cradle was solar powered. Casey estimated that the cells would last another 13 to 14,000 years. Unless the sun decided to burn out several billion years early, I remained safe in my luxury fortress. Furthermore, considering I was still the sole occupant, there were enough priority exclusive food supplies to last my entire lifetime, if not more.
The other piece of bad news was more personal. Standing in the bathroom of my suite, with the automated shaver humming, I spotted faint grays and whites in my hair. Casey confirmed that I had turned 37 while in stasis, in my year's time. My waking years of searching had cost me three full years of my life. The age itself wasn't the issue, but when I found my perfected Elena, she would still begin at 20 years of age, 19 when accounting for her actual day of birth. The already wide gap we had, as it had been in the old world, was now stretching even wider. In continuing on this path, I faced the risk of having fewer future years to share with her and the possibility that she might no longer find me as physically desirable as she once did. I stared down at the one functioning pod in the chamber, the pod that had seen me through all these millennia. This is the last time, Casey, I said with finality. No matter what she looks like, we're shutting this whole section down. If I don't do it myself, I'm ordering you to. I am unable to execute such a command. I exhaled deeply. Fine, just make sure I get my last message. As you wish, sir. I had deleted all of the previous log entries. The message I left in the suite provided some information but didn't delve into any details that might tempt him, or rather me, to repeat the process. There was nothing more I could do. As I was about to settle into the pod, Casey's voice stopped me. Sir, I am detecting a sizable, unidentified vessel approaching the western coast. I slowly rose. Vessel? The cracked wall screen flickered to life. One of Casey's mobile units was positioned by the western coast, providing a clear view of a large wooden sailing ship. Two others trailed a short distance behind. My heart leapt to my throat. Where did they come from? One of the six cradles is the likely source of their origin, Casey replied. Quickly climbing out of the pod, my thoughts raced. How many years has it been since the cradles landed? Five thousand two hundred years, Casey responded. Throughout all my time, I hadn't considered the other cradles. There was no reason to. None of the logs mentioned any communication with them since the cradle came online. Do they know I'm here? Do they know there is a cradle here? If standard procedures were followed, all cradle facilities would have shut down 70 years after landing. Given the amount of time that has transpired, the descendants of the original occupants would likely have no knowledge of this cradle facility. My thoughts swirled. These people had evolved independently for over 5,000 years. Unlike the island's descendants, they had progressed to a level where they could now cross oceans. Will they be friendly? I asked with skeptical hope. Based on historical patterns, there is a high probability of immediate hostility. I would recommend remaining within the cradle until a further analysis can be made. I trembled as I stared at the distant ships. Three smaller shore boats were parting, all headed in the same direction. The campfires, I realized, panic setting in. They've seen their campfires. I raced to the exit. We have to get out there, we have to warn them. Based on the speed of their approach, you will not reach the village in time. To hell with time, I left the chamber. I grabbed the nearest weapon in recreation, a large shotgun. One of Casey's white orb units hovered in, waiting. Don't try to stop me, I said fiercely, quickly looking over the weapon and hoping I remembered how to use it. I am unable to physically restrain a priority passenger. Good. I placed a smaller side pistol under the belt of my stasis overalls and turned to the hovering unit. You're coming with me. Cradle, written by Mahul Desai, based on an original feature film screenplay by Mahul Desai. This novella has been AI assisted. All scenes, characters, Situations and dialogue have been taken from the original feature film screenplay, WGA West Registry, 2147147. Two Music licensed from Pond 5, special sound effects by Serban Matai. For more information, email intothecradle at gmail.com.